Thank you very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, in the latest from the high drama of the murder investigation destabilizing the tiny mountain kingdom of Lesotho, Prime Minister Thomas Tabane has been questioned by police over the killing of his late wife in 2017. This, as his current spouse, is on the run under an arrest warrant. Also, 36 civilians were killed in Burkina Faso this week. Faced with repeated jihadist attacks, the countries voted to bring in a new law providing funding and training to local civilian groups. And private money solving public problems in Zimbabwe. A billionaire steps in to end a doctor's strike that has been crippling the country since last September. We hear from our correspondent in the country. But first, in the latest from the high drama of the murder investigation destabilizing the political elite of Lesotho, Prime Minister Thomas Tabane has been questioned by police over the killing of his ex-wife three years ago. 58-year-old Lipulelo Tabane was gunned down in 2017. Now, the couple had been embroiled in a bitter divorce battle at the time. Tabane's current wife has been on the run ever since police issued an arrest warrant for her earlier this month. The affair has led to Bernie saying that he'll be stepping down from office, although he hasn't said exactly when that will be. For more on this, we're joined by our regional correspondent, Jane Flanagan. Jane, first of all, why is Tabani and his current wife suspected of having anything to do with Lipolelo's death? Well, the prime minister's involvement was uh, first uh, pointed to in court documents filed uh, by the the police chief of Lesotho, Tom Tabani, had filed, uh, fired the police chief, who is Holomisu Molobeli, and the police chief claims it's because he was very close to uh, naming the prime minister as a suspect in his estranged wife's murder inquiry. So in order to fight his sacking, the police chief filed affidavits to the court saying what the evidence is against the Prime Minister and what the motivation was for his sacking. And we discovered from those court documents that a phone call made from the murder scene uh, back in 2017 had been traced to the Prime Minister's phone. We're not quite sure what the evidence is against the current First Lady. As, she's, as you say, she's in hiding, possibly still at the State House where she she hasn't um where the police haven't been able to track her due to the the prime minister's own security situation but uh she certainly failed to uh, attend the police station and answer questions and now there is a warrant out for her arrest now we've already seen tabani saying that he'll be stepping down what further political effect is all of this likely to have in the long term well, um, we have no idea when he's going to step down. And there are negotiations going on at the moment to organise that. South Africa sent an emissary to try and smooth the path of that. Lesotho has had a very troubled political history. It's had a string of very shaky coalitions that have never managed to really make much progress in delivering um, progress for um, the rather impoverished but small population. And Tom Tabani has been prime minister in the past, but had to flee to South Africa following a coup attempt. So it's always had a very turbulent history. And uh, there has been a motion of no confidence in Tom Tabani by his own party. And many in the party will be very, very uh, pleased now to see the back of him when that actually happens. He is a man of 80 years old. And it does seem to be that He's trying to negotiate a slightly more dignified exit. But whether he faces police charges, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But perhaps, uh, you know, the Basutu people are very much hoping that uh, this scandal, as much as it's riveted the kingdom, will perhaps mark a break with the past and perhaps a smoother political future for the kingdom. Thanks very much. Jane Flanagan there for us in uh, Cape Town on the scandal currently embroiling Lesotho. Well, Burkina Faso is boosting reliance on civilians in its battle against the escalating threat from extremists. Just days after 36 people were killed in an attack on a market, a new law has cemented the collaboration. Nicolas Chemin tells us more. President Roque-Marc Christian Caboret announced two days of mourning after 36 civilians were killed. Sadly, this has become a ritual in Burkina Faso. 
Jihadist attacks have killed more than 750 people in the country since 2015. This week, Parliament voted a new law that enables the recruitment of vigilantes. They will have to be at least 18 and be approved by a local assembly. They will also receive a military training that will last 14 days. The United Nations and human rights activists are worried about the creation of these militias. They fear it could spark inter-ethnic violence. If the state wants to recruit vigilantes, it's partly because the army is poorly trained and equipped. But the army says it's made progress in recent months, killing around 100 jihadists. Attacks in Burkina Faso only really began after the fall of Blaise Compaoré in 2014. He spent 27 years in power and only quit following mass protests. When he was president, there were no attacks as he was a prominent regional mediator who often negotiated with various jihadists. Look now at some news in brief. Peacekeepers say that at least 19 villagers were killed on Wednesday in the disputed region of Ebi on Wednesday. On Wednesday locals claim that the toll is actually at least 32. Nomadic Miseria herders are suspected of being behind the attack. Abiy lies on the border between Sudan and South Sudan and is claimed by both. Eritrea, Nigeria, Sudan and Tanzania are on a provisional list being brought, drawn up by Washington of countries to be affected by an expansion of its travel ban. Altogether, seven nations could be affected, but they have been told that they could avoid being included if they make changes before the restrictions are made official. The original bans were brought in on January 27, 2017, and the final announcement of the expansion list is expected to perhaps coincide with the third anniversary of the original controversial immigration clampdown. South Africa's military has dropped charges against an officer who refused to take off her headscarf underneath her uniform beret. Major Fatima Isaacs was indicted in June 2018. Despite the withdrawal of the charges this week, Isaacs, a forensic pathologist, plans on mounting a challenge in an equality court to fight against discrimination in South Africa's national forces. Now to Zimbabwe, where on Wednesday, a billionaire stepped in to end a doctor's strike that has been crippling the country since last September. Strive Masiyiwa is a telecoms tycoon who's worth an estimated one billion dollars. Medics and the government have failed to agree on wage increases during the strikes, but Masiyu was offered to pay doctors a monthly subsidy to cover living and travel costs. That'll work out to at least about 270 euros a month. However, state hospitals are still struggling with chronic drug and equipment shortages. Ryan Truscott joins us now with more. Ryan, tell me more about Masiyiwa and why he felt the need to get involved. Yes, well, he's a he's a respected uh, Zimbabwean businessman. He's the, the the country's wealthiest man. He's not he's not based in Zimbabwe. He lives in London, uh, but he maintains close links with the country. And he and his wife uh, Tsitsi run a, a charity known as the Higher Life Foundation. And the the foundation initially made this offer to doctors uh, back in December. Uh, December is a very bad month for, for traffic accidents here. So the, the foundation wanted to see hospitals adequately staffed in case of emergencies. Uh, initially, Masiwa's offer was, was treated with some suspicion by the doctors. They felt he was working in cahoots with the government uh, to get them back to work. So although it was seen as an enticing offer then, it didn't get uh, uh, the majority of doctors back to work. But now the, the High Life Foundation has reissued this offer and most of the doctors are now applying for this fellowship. Uh, when it comes uh, to the comes strike to the itself, point. it wasn't just about the money, just about pay at least. So are there any plans from the doctors union to keep pushing for the better working conditions that were also part of the demands of the strike that they've been holding since last year? Well, that, that's a question I put to a senior official from the, the Hospital Doctors Association. He said that the, the doctors can still raise their concerns forcefully uh, with the government while still reporting for duty. I, I think there's an understanding that the doctors, uh, many of them need to carry on with their training. Many are doing housemanships or internships uh, and, and also examinations, but those have all been disrupted by the strike. Um, things are still dire at state hospitals though. Earlier this week, senior doctors 
who had also joined the strike in sympathy with their juniors, said that they would now scale up their services, but they said that they still can't do uh, big operations or complicated surgery uh, simply because they, that they don't have the equipment to do that. And when it comes to the, the allowances that Massey U.S. Foundation is offering, how are they going to be structured and what happens when they inevitably come to an end? Well, these, these allowances are being paid out of a fund of around 100 million Zimbabwe dollars. That's around 6 million euros. It's enough to fund around 2,000 doctors over the next six months. Uh, critics have said that this offer, while generous, isn't really sustainable, you know, that this might turn out to be a, a bottomless pit. And hospitals do remain in crisis. I mean, last week, there was a serious bus accident in the east of the country. The injured were rushed to the main provincial hospital there, but it had only one doctor in ICU and only one working X-ray machine. So these are the kinds of challenges that doctors and their patients uh, will continue to face. Thanks very much, Ryan Truscott there for us in Harare. And finally, a quick visit back to Bisi and Eyenga Maviyu. They have returned home to Cameroon. The tiny twins were born conjoined and were separated here in France in Lyon last November when they were just a year old. Well, now the pair have been recovering and have headed back to their home. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks very much for joining us. Do so again if you can. Take care. Residents from France's disadvantaged suburbs tell their own stories and take the viewers beyond the usual cliches about the French banlieue. Sur le plan euh, humain, c'est en fait c'est une expérience de fou en fait. Les habitants valent beaucoup mieux que ce qu'on en dit. Tu rends fier ta ville, les, les, les gens qui quand ils me voient dans la rue me disent je suis fier de toi. Je t'ai vu passer à la télé, c'est bien comment t'as parlé, tu nous as bien représenté. Watch their daily reality in the Bonlier Project on France 24 and France24.com.